That's right, Half-Life 2 is finally a PC VR game. I need you to sit down here for a minute and listen carefully before I tell you how to install this. Yes, it's called Half-Life 2 VR Mod, but forget it even contains the word mod. Later in this video, I'm going to show you why this mod quote unquote is actually no different than an excellent game with native VR support. This doesn't just enable VR in the game like Vorpex would. This isn't the kind of pet project that takes weeks of setup with cryptic stacks of additional mods. This is literally a whole entire copy of Half-Life 2 built to run on its own in VR with native VR runtimes that offer you maximum performance and the sharpest possible graphics. It's got everything you'd expect from a commercial product, proper VR mechanics, menus and gameplay, user-friendly introductions to various controls with tooltips describing available actions you can perform, enough options to tweak the game for your system, and a performance that is well above your more modern VR game. This is by no means at par with other mods. This is comparable to full retail VR titles, and frankly, it beats quite a few of them. Mechanically speaking, it's highly comparable to Half-Life Alex, and in terms of performance, it's about as smooth as the serious Sam VR adaptations that run like warm butter. Make no mistake, while there's the word mod in here in the name of this thing, it's the furthest thing I've ever seen from an actual mod. This is the real deal, it's Half-Life 2 in native VR. Forget the word mod here, it's just not a correct description for what we have on our hands. This thing is amazing. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase here because you saw the title of this video and the intro, and the most important thing to you right now is probably, how do I make my Half-Life 2 run in VR? Fortunately, the answer to that is unbelievably simple. If you have Steam and already own Half-Life 2, it's easy. Search the store for a title called Half-Life 2 VR Mod. Once you find that, just install it. It's automatically accessible to everyone who owns the base game. Now, if you don't own Half-Life 2, here's the deal. If you own a VR kit, you need to buy this game. It's affordable, it's often on sale, and it's a gateway to one of the best VR games you don't yet have. For the newcomers, the procedure is effectively the same. Buy Half-Life 2, then install the game called Half-Life 2 VR Mod. That's it, by the way. There's nothing else to install. There's nothing else to do. From here, you just run Half-Life 2 VR from your Steam library, just like you would any other VR game. Slap your headset on and start playing. No weird shit, no add-ons, no nothing, just a normal VR game. This is awesome. When I started my channel in 2013, my goal was to simply show off stereoscopic 3D content. Whether it would be gaming, whether it would be video, as long as it was something with depth perception, it would be something I'd want to cover or feature on my new channel somehow. With the first piece of content on my channel being a stereoscopic 3D diving video I shot myself, and while I originally intended on having a lot more live-action stereo content on here, what happened in the months following that dive video in retrospect makes a lot of sense. Gaming took over the channel. That's right, it turns out if you're in the search for good stereoscopic content, gaming is really where it's at. An endless wealth of quality depth perception, one that thanks to its flexibility exceeds the quality of stereoscopic video. When 2013 came around, being neck deep into stereoscopic gaming by then, the Oculus Rift DK1 went from Kickstarter to outright taking orders from the public and I was one of the early ones at the gates, ordering my kit in August 2013. Sure enough, by early 2014, I was ready to start giving my first impressions of this VR kit along with the content that I'd tried in it. One of these trials was getting used to playing Half-Life 2 in VR for sustained periods of time. That's right, in 2014, Valve launched experimental seated VR support for the sequel in their flagship series. While we didn't have motion controls yet, the game was fully playable in perfect stereoscopic 3D with full VR tracking and one of the most interesting seated VR control schemes I encountered during the development days of VR. 
This adaptation of Half-Life 2 in 2014 was simply beautiful. First, it allowed us to use the nuance and precision of the mouse instead of having to rotate at a near fixed speed, one that is always too slow or too fast. With the mouse, the player can rotate anywhere between dash snap rotation speed and slow pan speed with everything in between. This ability to nuance the turning made it much easier to adapt to artificial rotation with the mouse, and Half-Life 2's implementation made this even better. The mouse aim had a little horizontal dead zone where it would move your gun but not your rotation. This way, aiming could be done with fine movements while rotation would kick in as soon as you expected the aim bounds. This was a very clever way of partly coupling the rotation with the player rig, and I since have never seen a game handle couple rotation like this again. Thanks to this extremely comfortable control scheme, after about two hours of gameplay in the main campaign, played in short half-hour bursts, I eventually managed to adapt some pretty solid VR legs, enough to start playing longer and longer sessions. When the Oculus DK2 landed in mid-2014, I quickly got my hands on one and that's where things really picked up steam. I'll never forget the Twitch stream session I did in October 2014. This was my turning point for VR comfort. The first time I played a VR game for longer than an hour with no discomfort whatsoever. Gone were the days of high persistence, extremely low res and motion blurred to hell VR in the DK1. The DK2 offered a much crisper image akin to the first Oculus consumer model, and Half-Life 2 was a perfect fit for it, finally allowing me to progress past the airboat section in the game. That session would finally open Pandora's box for me. Shortly after, I would open up the Alien Isolation Let's Play series, quickly then followed by the Ark Saga. Half-Life 2 marks my beginning in VR. It's a game I hadn't had the chance to play when it originally came out, and so my first experience of it came in the form of virtual reality. My first walk through City 17 felt like I was really there. As time went on, VR runtime started evolving quickly, to the point where the experimental support in Half-Life 2 fell into obsolescence. By late 2015, in order to play Half-Life 2, I had to uninstall the newest VR runtimes and install a cryptically old version of Steam VR. It was no longer realistically possible to keep my system current while having access to the legacy stuff I needed for Half-Life. By 2016, the experimental support was nearly impossible to run, interrupting what I had hoped would be a full end-to-end -end VR run of the game. The lack of updates for Half-Life 2's VR support sent the game into a sort of nuclear winter. There were a few rays of light shining through with a glimmer of hope on a few occasions, but they were just that, a mere glimmer. First, I attempted to resume the game using the Vorpex adaptation back in 2018. Vorpex is effectively able to run this game about as well as it does Portal 2, so I thought it would be smooth sailing for me, but upon loading in, it had the same issues as Portal 2, notably, the guns have no depth. This is something I was ready to accept with Portal since we had no other means of running that game in VR, but honestly for Half-Life 2, having used that old amazing VR support, I could not go back to an adaptation with desktop style forced camera motion, no depth on the gun models and vehicles that would give extreme discomfort. I just couldn't downgrade to this. Sorry Vorpex, I love you, but not in Half-Life 2. I've been spoiled. Much later in 2022, I finally decided to try something I had heard a lot about. Apparently, there was a way to run Half-Life 2 in VR using Gary's mod. And while I was highly skeptical, I sort of regretted not trying this adaptation earlier as it was quite good. It was what I like to call a mod stack setup or a Frankenstein adaptation. There was a lot of steps to the setup, a lot of precautions to take, and a lot of limitations. But when I finally got around to trying it, it delivered me the closest thing to the original experimental VR support, all while augmenting the experience with full motion control support. The Gary's mod setup was truly exciting, as while it was complicated to use and required third-party mods to handle the Half-Life 2 campaign and its save files, it did play smoothly and almost all the mechanics worked very well in it. There was just one thing wrong and I'm partly glad I never got far enough in the game to try it. 
all the vehicles were so poorly adapted, or not adapted at all, should I say, they were effectively sickness generators. Even the most hardcore players I know reported they had to either skip those sections or just endure maximum discomfort. For me, sadly, without proper vehicle support, while this adaptation was in fact good, Half-Life 2 as a whole, without its vehicles, is not complete. And so, I went back to the waiting game. Later in 2022, one of the YouTubers I follow, Dr. Greg VR, was playing the Half-Life 2 VR mod beta on his channel. By then I was aware of this mod's existence, but I had not seen it firsthand yet and I didn't know how to get my hands on it. However, Dr. Greg was kind enough to point me to the right place. I requested a key from Wormslayer on the Flat2VR modder's Discord and I was given it only minutes later. Now I was a proud beta tester for what seemed to be one of the most anticipated upcoming VR retrofits of the year. By the way, before I keep going, take a look in the description for a link to that Discord server and another link to Dr. Greg VR's channel. They are both awesome places to be. Now, my first session with this mod, or should I just say this game? I mean, it's a copy of Half-Life 2 built to run in VR. I think I'm just gonna call it a game. So, the first session I had with this game was during the beta testing phase. I made sure to document my experience as extensively as possible and report any issues I ran into because otherwise I would have felt like my key went in vain. If I was going to play it during the beta, I was going to try to make myself useful. And the issues were there. The biggest problem with the game at this point was the hit detection being downright dissident. The crowbar could barely ever hit enemies despite clearly landing a strike, and the guns would just send their projectiles flying through enemies without actually damaging them. Some of the control inputs weren't always clear and sometimes the save system would do strange things. But make no mistake, even with these issues, this was already the very best VR adaptation of Half-Life 2 I had ever seen, even going as far as almost beating the original experimental support released back in late 2013. With the hit detection problems out of the way, I knew this game would be perfectly retrofitted for VR. It was clear that we were, after all, finally getting Half-Life 2 in VR. Every single week, the mod would make giant strides towards becoming a commercial-grade VR game. Every single issue I reported was looked at by the devs, and most of them were actually fixed, put aside a couple of problems that were straight up my fault. The extended testing was necessary, because in the end, the product that was released, the full game with proper VR support, came with so much polish that you couldn't tell it apart from a commercial VR release. This has now become the definitive way of playing Half-Life 2 in VR. In fact, it's become the definitive way of playing the game itself. Yes, it's official. Thanks to the Worm Slayer Half-Life 2 VR mod, Half-Life 2 is now a PC VR game. It beats everything that came before it, and in this rare occasions, it transforms its target into a retail-ready VR product. And it's free! Now that I've found the perfect adaptation, one that I must admit is much better than even the 2014 variant, it's time we talk about the various elements that came together in this mod. I played the game for a little under 10 hours as of making this video, most of this playtime coming after the mod's official launch. Issues have been resolved, polish has been added, there's only a few microscopic gremlins left, and I'll detail as much of this ensemble as I can going forth. One of the most important things with a modern VR mod, one of the things I have hit walls with the most often are the controls. Look, I'm not picky, y'all can bind your functions whichever way you want them, but the point that becomes important is you all gotta let us know what your bindings are, instead of letting us mash the buttons until we find out which one does what we want to do. Even with this mod during beta testing, I had brought this up as one of the reasons I would not have deemed it native VR worthy, quote unquote. Yes, the control bindings existed, they were great, but they weren't explained and whatever didn't perfectly line up with Half-Life Alex's controls, I had to do a bit of button mashing discovery to figure it out. This is usually not a major negative with mods, but it is a step that adds an extra degree of retail-worthy convenience and likely helps players maximize their enjoyment right off the bat. 
Well, go figure. When they launched Half-Life 2 VR, they actually added tooltip hint systems that progressively tell you what controls to press. For example, at the beginning it explains basic movement, and when you pick up a weapon for the first time it lets you know how to use it. Amazingly, it fully describes how to reload your gun even. While I had to improvise a few times during beta testing, after launch I found myself almost never needing to experiment with buttons for the simple fact that the game would tell me exactly what to do. With a control scheme similar to Half-Life Alex, Half-Life 2 VR has a VR-friendly heads-up display, VR-friendly weapon switching, grabbing objects, immersive or automatic door opening, immersive or automatic grenade throwing, immersive or automatic ladders, gunplay with manual reloading sequence, jumping, running, melee, swimming, driving, and boating. While writing this, I'm realizing now this may be the largest control and interaction set I've ever seen in a VR game up until now. While menu navigation is excellent, I do need to point out a couple of issues with it. I think Airlink may be causing this, I'm not sure. I may have seen it happen with the index as well, but I've seen the title screen menu open up at different sizes and sometimes that can make it hard to read. In my last Airlink session, I really noticed the issue stood out because the UI was either too small or too far. Either way, it made it really hard to read. I have since taken the habit of making sure I reset my position with Oculus before loading into the game, which might help spawning me closer enough to the menu. Hopefully this helps you out if you spot the issue as well. Also, my second complaint with the menus is the lack of graphic options. First, I can't seem to find a resolution option, something I think would be cool especially for experimentation. The options under the performance tab are useful, but I feel like more graphic related items could be exposed in a tab of their own. Settings for the size and mode of the main game window, for example, would be really cool. All in all, this isn't a critically weak point of the mod, but I think it's still worth pointing this out. The weakest point of the game's interactions, in my opinion, is the ladders. Now, in terms of retrofit, they're actually great. You've got the option to use immersive ladders, where you have to manually grab onto the ladder and pull yourself up either one or two-handed, and you have the option for the stick ladders, which will respond mostly like the ladders in the original game. Now, for me, the immersive ladder mechanic here is amazing. It's very, very well implemented, and it's actually the most reliable option for getting on and off ladders. The problem is the speed of it, especially when you're holding a weapon in one hand and you don't want to have to constantly switch back and forth between weapon and empty hand, the one-handed climb will be slow. Furthermore, this mechanic sadly puts my controllers at a great threat. I play in a room with a relatively low ceiling and it's way too easy for me to hit my controller with quite a bit of force while using this mechanic. Because of this I've had to resort to stick ladders and let me tell you, this brings back memories. Jesus Christ, are these ladders unreliable or what? Look, this is not on the mod at all. I remember this clearly being a problem with the 2014 adaptation. This thing loves not letting you off ladders. Sometimes it'll even refuse to latch onto the damn ladders, especially when you're in the water. Look, if unlike me, you've got the space to use it, a high enough ceiling, by all means, please stick to immersive ladders. They're just so much more reliable that even though it might take a little longer, you'll just have far less frustrations with the game and its classic ladder mechanics. I may well do this myself by trying the game on a different system in my house which lies in a room with a much higher ceiling. One thing you'll notice in this adaptation is that you can pick up almost everything in sight. Yes, there are props that seem locked to the scenery, but for a retrofit of the sort, I've been surprised by how many objects I was able to pick up around me, sometimes being everything in sight that's light enough to be picked up. I've literally used the grab mechanic to make a zombie torso appear as if they were giving a speech as the mayor of the town. The amount of freedom here is awesome. Be careful though, the game has pushback mechanics. That being, if you try to force through an object or a wall, the game will nudge you back in response. You'll also get nudged back if an object bumps against you, especially when carrying or stacking. This pushback can be uncomfortable and over time might become less bearable. If you start tossing big objects around or massively screwing up your attempts at stacking things, you will eventually feel some discomfort. It's never really pushed me to the point of requiring a break or anything like that, but I still felt it enough that I think I needed to warn you about it. 
Be careful, by the way. There is one interaction that I found was absolutely hardcore in there, the water. For the most part, the water won't bother anyone, but it's the surface bobbing and the pushback. If you keep surfacing and going under, over and over, you'll start feeling it and it doesn't feel good. If you're floating near a wall or worse, next to a large object that's bobbing, you're going to feel it when it bumps against you and again, it's not good. Take care in the water to play it smooth. Don't rush those sections too badly and that applies to even the hardcore VR players. If you do it smooth, the water will be fine. In fact, it might feel great. But if you try to rush things and start unwittingly bumping into things, surfacing and going under often in a loop, struggling to get on ladders frequently, you will eventually need a break. There's not much the mod could do about this issue other than like completely reinventing the entire physics system, which would be an insane expectation. So play it smooth, don't start flailing around trying to rush those parts and you'll be good. A controls issue I keep encountering the most is specific to the valve index. It's like I have super glue on my palms. I keep accidentally grabbing objects as I walk past them. Boxes, dead bodies, barrels, trash. If I'm near it and I'm playing with the index, I'll probably grab it without wanting to. Okay, not that often, but jokes aside, I've been told to adjust the grip sensitivity on my controllers, but that either makes things worse by the grips not being sensitive at all, or just compounds the original issue by having a higher sensitivity. The problem here is a real oddity. I found myself trying to put things down by opening my hand wide and flat, completely letting go of the controller, only to still see my in-game hand holding on to the unwanted object. I'm not sure why it's working like this, besides the stupid trackpads, I have no issues with these controllers in any other game, and it's only Half-Life 2 VR that ignores my grip sensitivity and decides when I'm grabbing something or not. This also gave for a few strange moments, like for example, while trying to grab a mounted gun, I kept accidentally pulling out a new clip with my left hand, which took me a second to realize and led to a bit of confusion. All in all, the controls in this game are incredibly good, and most of the interactions respect the level of quality that VR games should try to abide by these days. Half-Life 2 really deserve to have this good a mechanical retrofit, and sure enough, what we have here is no short of amazing. One of the most important things of Half-Life 2 are the guns and how the combat goes down. And I'm happy to report that with this modded version of the game, this part has become one of the best aspects of the adaptation so far. Again here, if you've played Half-Life Alex, you'll get a hang of this combat in three seconds. The guns each have their own unique physical reloading sequence. And while I'm personally not a fan of these in general, I do think they're implemented as well as any game could. It makes the process a lot more fun when it's responsive, and this with both headsets I played on, the Valve Index and the Oculus Quest 2. I only really had issues with the reload at the beginning while getting the hang of it. By now, I've had to do it with the pistol enough times that it's become mostly reflex. Something I liked less about this adaptation, but again, more of a thing of a personal preference, was the two-handed weapons. I don't know, for me, it just feels wobbly because of the fact that my hands aren't actually connected together by the solid body of a gun. I know a lot of you out there are fans of this kind of mechanic, and I can recognize that it's really well done here, so this aspect will definitely make you happy despite me not being a fan of it. One of my favorite guns in the game so far is the Magnum. This thing feels like a small handgun that fires the equivalent of a 12 gauge four shot shotgun shell. It's really amazing. In a section where I had originally used the machine gun in my 2014 run, this time I opted for the Magnum and it was absolutely utterly satisfying. Now, I must say, its reload mechanic is a bit weird to get the hang of, but on the bright side, it kills things in one shot so often that by the time you're out of ammo, all threats will be dead, giving you plenty of time to figure out the reloading. My least favorite gun was the mounted gun, like the one at the beginning of the game. Seriously, what is this thing doing? It just feels completely wrong in VR, and while I can accept a sort of latency in the movement of it, thus simulating the weight of such a gun, I can't accept the fact that it just really doesn't line up at all with what my hands are doing. It never feels like it's pointing where my hands would make it point. 
In addition to this, the flame effect on the muzzle is so intense, you'll be forced to look at the sides of the gun as you fire in order to see the tracers and know what you're hitting. I don't remember this gun being as bad in the 2014 seated adaptation. I wonder if this couldn't be improved somehow, maybe a name system similar to the one in the airboat, because I'll admit this is the single worst weapon in the entire game as it is now. Sure enough, the other mounted guns you see later in the game during the hunter-chopper sections actually handle 10 times better. Assuming those are meant to be a different type, I don't know, but those fired a lot better. Now, there is one more weapon to talk about when it comes to combat. The crowbar. And look, I'm never the best person to ask with this type of thing because as you may know from the rest of the content on my channel, I absolutely detest VR Melee. It's never compelling to me and it's most often annoying, and this is quickly compounded when it's not done right. There is a silver lining here, however. First, the game is far from melee-centric. Sure, you can use that if you want, but you're never really forced to, except in a few sections where the game tries to show you something, or if you need to break into an opening covered with obstacles. Secondly, for what it's worth, this melee is incredibly well implemented, finally. There were some pretty major hit detection issues with the crowbar during beta testing, but I've since confirmed that those are long gone, so when you hit something, you'll be doing the right amount of damage just as you'd expect it. It's great to finally be able to destroy those goddamn drones again. Bottom line is the melee mechanic here is as good as it gets for a game that doesn't have its focus on that. It's very good and it hasn't forced me to put my controllers in danger once since launch. I'm surprisingly happy with this. The last thing I have to bring up is the throwables. Yes, this is done perfectly right. You're given two options. Options, which by the way, are described in that amazing hint tooltip. You can hold down B to prepare an automatic throw along a curve that you'll see in a preview until you let go of the button, at which point it's going to throw the grenade. But of course, if you like to throw physically instead of hitting B, just press the trigger and hold it down, then throw while releasing the trigger. While I'm a big fan of the first option, the automatic throw, because it keeps things low risk for the controllers, I have to give them credit here for the excellent physical throw mechanic. This might be far well better than even Half-Life Alex has it. I've switched between the two methods a bit and both really have their specific purposes. I do have another weapon to cover, but it happens to be a part of something greater than just a gun. It's time to move on to how the vehicles fare in this modded version of Half-Life 2. While I haven't had a chance to try the dune buggy yet, I did get plenty of time with the airboat, and I think I've seen enough to tell that these vehicles are not only incredible, but there's also chances I like the buggy even more when I get there. I mean, what the hell? How is this so damn good? I really can't see much difference from the 2014 edition. This is exactly just as great. I do wish the steering was done with the right stick while the throttle was controlled with the left stick. Right now, the left stick controls everything in one, and that can feel a little overly sensitive in corners. That being said, I almost had no crashes going into the airboat sections, and at most times, despite a bit of a wobble, I was able to line up exactly the maneuver I wanted. I do have a word of warning though, do not use this as if you were playing on a desktop screen. That being, don't stare straight ahead as you steer, instead anticipate your corners by looking at where you intend to go as you steer. Staring straight ahead will naturally bring you growing discomfort and it's just not a good idea. If you're feeling weird on these vehicles, follow this advice and you'll see a drastic improvement. Now be especially careful with the airboat. At speed, the airboat feels incredible, zero discomfort. Even during the steering wobble moments and the jumps, it's simply great. However, at low speed on water, it's another story with the bobbing. Again, we get back to the issue I described in the controls and interactions section of this video. The bobbing and sudden movements the water produces can be quite intense, and those can really ruin a play session quickly. Take care not to have the airboat slowly tumble as you try to get over an obstacle at low speed. Take care not to stop and go too often. The bobbing might become too much. The precaution is similar to the one I gave about water, except all these issues disappear at high speed completely. 
One thing that I was absolutely terrified about before reaching that point, how was the airboat's gun going to aim? I was so worried it would be difficult to get a hang of when facing the hunter chopper because it would like be implemented somewhere along the lines of the Gmod variant of the game. Boy was I ever so dead wrong and boy am I so very happy to be saying this. The gun is absolutely amazing. This is one of those weapons that feels suddenly overpowered compared to the desktop version of the game for how so very easy it is to aim. In 2014, I recall taking a good five to six minutes to take the Hunter Chopper down, but this time around, almost a decade later, the task took me only about three minutes. I took the thing down so quickly, I even checked that I was playing on normal difficulty in the settings following the fight. For the most part, my run through the Hunter Chopper levels was nothing short of putting my fingers in a goddamn electrical outlet, but in a good way. The gameplay felt intense, and because you feel completely in control at high speeds, you eventually reach a point where anticipating feels completely natural, and the amount of extreme close calls you can work your way around becomes an absolute thrill. I've really enjoyed the airboat section just as I originally did in 2014 with the seated edition, and let me tell you, it's a great thing that we haven't lost this amazing piece of VR gameplay thanks to these modders. I cannot wait to get to the dune buggy go-kart thingy, and like I said, I think I'll like that one even more. There's one point in this adaptation where we're obviously limited. How do these environments and the props and characters within them fare when ported over to VR? Given these were created in 2004, you'd expect some shortcomings in graphical fidelity, and you'd be correct. Depending on where you are, you'll sometimes notice geometry or textures that are way behind on the times. However, make no mistake, primarily I expect you'll be just as surprised as me as to how the world is still very compelling in VR, far more so than if you ran this game on a desktop in 2D. In addition to being able to benefit from multi-sample anti-aliasing, one of the most efficient ways of supersampling the edges and graphics, along with the ability to run at very high resolutions to begin with, given the game's age and low resource footprint, the in-headset result is no short of utterly satisfying. City 17 will look as detailed as you've ever seen it before as those canals stream by your eyes while you speed through on the airboat for long periods of time, you'll be quite surprised how real everything looks. This goes a long way for immersion and will really get you into the action. The same can be said for the characters. Yes, they're short on polygons, and yes, some of the animations show their age, but as an ensemble, when participating in the scenes, and given the fact that this game plays said scenes while leaving you in full control of your character, the result is extremely compelling to the point where you'll often find yourself talking back and gesturing to the characters as they go about their play. Something I've really been enjoying about this mod in terms of characters is how genuine the enemies feel. Both the Combine soldiers and the zombies each have their own very realistic traits, driving you to change your playstyle as you go from action sections to horror sections, just purely based on their behavior differences and thus completely adjusting your mood along the way, from heart-pumping action to trembling horror vibes. What is this enemy? What, what the hell is this thing? I've never seen it before. It's terrifying. I love it. This is perfect for VR. And here you have a perfect example of what I'm talking about. While the zombies in Ravenholm really set a dark horror vibe compared to the preceding soldier-filled parkour-riddled sections, this new enemy now raises the bar in that vibe and sends the game's mood into yet another completely different lane. The interactions with Grigori in my latest run paired with a complete change and feel really came together to give me something that feels surprisingly current for the age this game now has. The only weak spot I can point out in this category are the props. This is where you'll notice the game's age the most as those appear to be relatively a lot lower polygon than the rest such as characters and environment geometry. It's especially obvious now since you can carefully pick up items and inspect them closely, which just brings out the lack of detail in full light. Now this hasn't really impacted my immersion too much, because honestly the fact that we can interact with so much in this game world kind of negates the lack of detail on the props. 
I started noticing this while using the gravity gun, slowly realizing how many pieces of random junk can become efficient projectiles. The more props I see, the more complacent I get about detail and the more believable it all becomes to me. I do need to give you all heads up about one issue related to this category. The characters, when they walk close past you or right into you, they will push you back. Sure enough, just like all other warnings I gave you about pushback in this video, the same applies here. If you get shoved around too much by the characters, you will put yourself at risk of motion sickness. Once or twice is okay, but at my first time playing this, I must have gotten shoved around a good dozen times in under two minutes, and let me tell you that does not feel good at all. The uncommanded motion of these pushbacks is hardcore, and you really want to avoid them. I had one later in my playthroughs where Alex walked through me while I was crouched, and that was the single worst case for this issue. Dear Lord, don't let them trample you, it feels terrible. Take care to try and stay out of the character's way during cutscenes. I've gotten the hang of it myself for a while now, it only happens once or twice a session, which is fine. So even though Half-Life 2 was made in 2004, running this VR edition on a PC really brings out the game's greatness and reminds you how so much of it was ahead of its time. I've been really enjoying Ravenholm and I'm surprised how well the horror aesthetic is holding up across the board right after a long session with a more militaristic urban approach. I can't wait to see some reactions in the comments as how you felt about this game's world and characters when you first saw it in VR, because I expect you too will be quite blown away by the overall result. So now that we've gone over how the assets in the game look, let's talk about the overall graphics because this is an impressive point. DirectX 9 graphics are really carrying through well in this mod as nearly everything is not just friendly to stereoscopic 3D, but the ability to super sample the graphics overall and further super sample sharp edges with the extremely efficient multi-sample anti-aliasing method, something I mentioned in the previous section, gives for an incredibly crisp output with no edge shimmering, smooth frame rate and well rendered effects. From day to night, land and water, through all the cool effects you'll see, from the bloom in the canals as the sun goes down, to the fire as you roast enemies to death, and everything in between, the fidelity here is impressive. This is an aspect that feels even less dated than the environments and the characters, and actually helps to augment those. I did notice a couple of small issues so far. There seems to be some kind of culling going on in extremely rare situations. There was one moment where I could see some props pop in further down the room. They would pop in and out of existence a few times until I got closer. Another variation of this issue is one where I observed the water in the canal pop out a couple of times. In fact, this one was so minute that I thought it was just a graphical flicker until later I saw what was happening in my video capture. These are super rare, the only two times I notice such culling taking place. Each issue might be area specific rather than being a problem with the overall game. These haven't disrupted anything for me but I felt like I'd point them out in case you notice them and maybe in case they can be easily resolved. The other issue I saw happens occasionally with reflections in puddles, the only effect I've seen having stereoscopic display issues. In only one instance, at the beginning of the game while waiting to enter the teleporter, the reflection in the puddle near the main computer, or whatever that thing is, is not displaying correctly between the left and the right eye. Keep in mind this is the only instance of the issue that I've noticed. The problem likely exists in other places and again I'm pointing it out in the hopes that it can possibly be fixed or just in case you notice it. As you can probably tell this issue has not been disruptive at all for me. Half-Life 2 VR will run on mid to low spec systems with relatively high settings. I think this might be the one game that can run with maximum multi-sample anti-aliasing at a 4K resolution on something as old as a GTX 1060. Tone it down just a tad and you might be able to get excellent results out of even lower spec systems. It's the perfect adaptation graphically speaking. It's not just using third party injectors, no, it's going directly through your native VR runtimes to render its content. The most efficient method of running a game in VR and so it benefits of all the performance and visual fidelity perks that native VR games do. 
Graphically speaking, Half-Life 2 isn't just a VR game now. It's a VR game with current day graphic resolutions and capabilities. Half-Life 2 VR mod is the definitive edition of Half-Life 2. It's effectively revived the game and makes it feel more current and immersive than ever. This is something I've been dying to see happen since we lost the experimental support back in 2014 and I couldn't have asked for more than this. In addition to easily getting back into the world of Half-Life through this modded version of the game, I've now finally embarked on a Let's Play adventure, one where I finally should not have to start the game from the damn beginning anymore, a series in which I've now finally crossed into parts of the game I've never seen before. Yes, remember, I've never played Half-Life 2 on a monitor before, nor did I get a chance to finish it in VR back in 2014, and it truly feels like this product was released by Valve, playtested like hell, and brought into a tier of quality so high, I don't think anyone expected anything this damn good. Yes, I may adjust my opinion along the way based on what happens in the future, but I've seen enough of the overall mechanics and covered sufficient possibilities to say my opinion of this mod will in fact remain stellar. Not only is the mod well above expectations, but I need to give credit to Worm Slayer and the amazing team around him. I wish I had more time to playtest. I was caught up in too many projects last summer because in the only testing session I managed to deliver, I did report quite a list of issues. Problems that were quickly subsequently resolved with a level of expertise you'll have a hard time finding anywhere in this industry. Y'all did an amazing job and it's led up to something people will be able to play and replay for a very long time. Remember, all you need to do is own Half-Life 2 on Steam and search for the Half-Life 2 VR mod, install the free copy of the mod and you're good to go. There is absolutely no reason to put this off, unless of course you're busy with another VR title right now, this is a must play. You might be put off by the warnings I gave about possible discomfort throughout this video. Keep in mind I did this to be thorough. I have some pretty solid VR legs and I need to remain mindful of those who might not be in the same spot, being more sensitive to force movement or artificial locomotion. I should have given you the precautions you need in order to avoid such discomfort because this is no less different than any other game with full room scale style VR. The fact that I gave you those heads up now means you'll be able to avoid those situations instead of having to discover the issues for yourselves. By all means, as far as these kinds of VR games go, be it Boneworks, Into the Radius, or games like The Forest, there's always the little hardcore bits that you have to be careful with. Half-Life 2 VR is no different, and in fact I'd say compared to its peers it's a little less hard on the senses. I had the chance to try this with two headsets, three modes in total, first the Valve Index, then the Oculus Quest 2, first through Link with USB-C, then with Air Link over Wi-Fi at a fixed 200 megabits. I have to say, each of these experiences were almost indistinguishable from each other. They were all great. I give the visual edge to the index, thanks to that headset's amazing field of view and resolution balance, but I actually enjoyed it a little more with the Quest 2 overall, given those controllers feel a lot more natural to me and didn't present me with the grabbing issue I outlined earlier in this video. Whatever kit you have, if it runs over Steam VR, you're bound to be able to get full enjoyment out of this VR game. I know, I repeated this so many times throughout the video, but I feel like I have to do it one last time. I, I promise, just one. This really doesn't flow like a mod. From installation to operation, this in every way flows like a self-contained native VR game you got off Steam with a level of polish that even AAA studios fail to implement sometimes. This is as far as you'll experience a first-party VR game. I think you get the idea. I absolutely love this version of Half-Life 2. I'm completely sold on it and I hope you'll be jumping on getting your copy right when this video ends. Keep in mind that I have a Let's Play series of Half-Life 2 VR on my second channel, Stereo 3D Plays. I'll add a link to that channel in the description and a link to the series playlist if you want to follow along. 
I'm finally past the point where I was highly analytical about everything for the making of this very video, and I've got into my own groove just enjoying the game. I do make notes along the way if I notice issues or have suggestions to make, and so you can follow me through my experience and share your thoughts as we go. I hope to see you there. Until then, you've been watching Stereo 3D Productions and this first impressions review of the Half-Life 2 VR mod. The mod that's actually just a normal VR game that kicks ass. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.